Uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing to talk about covenant. Covenant, God's plan for relationships in our lives. And really, I'm just looking for any excuse to do this. <laughs> it just sounds so good. Oh, it feels good, too. If you want to come up here, not maybe not now, <laughs> but after service, you want to give this a little, uh, a little turn? Go for it. It's no problem. Somebody came through like, Is it, would I be able to turn it? I'm like, yeah, sure. You turn the drawbridge of covenant, you know, physically and metaphorically in your life. Do it as much as you can. We're going to come back to, to covenant this morning. Um, and we're, I'm going to be introducing the third element of covenant, uh, if you're keeping score out there. We have talked about the first two elements. The first one being the exchange of names. It's the idea of identity being a very important element of covenant. That when you're in covenant with someone, your identity is secured and celebrated. Like there's room for you to be you and for the other covenant member to, to be them. And of course, the best expression of that covenant is with our relationship with God. That when we're in right relationship with him, the real you is able to live fully and, and, and completely. The second element of covenant is sharing history or, or rehearsing history. Okay, both of those things. You share the history, like you have experiences together, you have intimacy, closeness together, and then you rehearse it later on as a way of reinforcing we aren't strangers with one another. We are, we are close. We have, we have closeness. Um, it's something that works really great if you've got kids, too. Hey, remember when you... Bah, 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 bah. Kids love hearing about how they were when they were younger, in part because I think in their little hearts, it secures them like, yes, I am a part of this family. I have had this experience and I'm going to, I'm going to have more. Well, the third element of covenant that we're going to be talking about this morning uh, is almost like temporally linear. Okay. Um, who you are, how you have been, where you are today, and then now what's next is the future. This element of covenant is making promises. In every covenant, there are promises that are exchanged between the covenant members. And the purpose of these promises is to secure the covenant members for their future. The idea is that the promises have no preconditions for fulfillment. It is a statement that I make to, let me use my wife as an example. I think most of us, if not all of us, love that moment when a man and a woman are about to make those vows to say, I will be toward you no matter what. Whether you get really sick, whether you're healthy, whether we're rich, whether we're poor, if it's up, if it's down, no matter what, I will be toward you this way. It's a promise I am making. And no matter what it is that's going on with you, no matter where you find yourself landing, I'm deciding I'm going to be this way toward you. That is a promise made in the boundaries of, of covenant. And we get that from somewhere. We didn't just come up with that. Hey, you know what would be a good idea, you know, with marriage? Like, maybe we should make some promises. We get that from God and him making promises towards, towards us. But the promises without precondition, the promises without an escape clause, without contractual obligations, and if you don't meet those obligations, then I'm off scot-free because, well, you didn't do this, and so then I don't have to do that. No, the Bible says that love keeps no record of wrong. You're not tallying up all the times that your husband didn't take the garbage out. And let's get real, it's a lot of times. <laughs> but neither is he tallying up all the times when you weren't caring about what was going on with work with him. That's not how covenant works. It's a promise to be towards somebody else even if there's difficult things that happen. Even if there's ruinous circumstances, even if there's sickness, erosion of the relationship, the promise made is a promise kept, and that's the promise made in covenant. I have found that for myself, this element of covenant is one that, like, yeah, I, I have a hard time with, I'm realizing. I'm realizing that my natural inclination is to not interact with God 
who makes me promises. And even though I know, I believe that he will not break those promises, for some reason, I have a hard time living in accordance with that. I hedge my bets. I lean right when it would be proper to, to lean left. And that's why I love the guys who, who made this thing because they made this gear. If you take it out and you put it in the wrong spot, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Kind of looks like it could work, but then you get going and you realize it slips. For me, this element of covenant is kind of like this gear, and I believe the Lord is rearranging some things in my heart and my mind so that I can really interact with him and his promises for me in the way that it was always intended to be. I find myself scurrying about almost, like trying to secure things for myself rather than resting in the promises that God has given me. And I'm going to give you an example of that. That happened to me this week. Yes, God is faithful to provide you with a sermon every weekend, somehow. <laughs> um, yeah. Promises that are made in covenant, the, the ultimate outcome is supposed to be the security of that covenant member as they live within that, I'm going to call it a land of promise. You may have heard this term before. <laughs> the promised land. It's a place that is carved out by promises, not performance. It's a place that's carved out by God for us. And you can learn that from God so that the way you treat your spouse, the way you treat your children, the way that you treat other people in covenant is you too can carve out a place for them, a place of your promises for them. And as you fulfill those promises, as you invite them to live in that space that is safe for them, the ultimate outcome is they are secure. Um, I tried to explain this first service, and I, <laughs> I don't think I did such a great job, but I'm going to try again. The thing that secures us for our future is, is not actually the fact that God has a plan for your life. He does have a plan for your life. I believe that 100%. Hallelujah. But you can get misaligned in covenant if you focus too much on what the particulars of your future will be rather than the fact that there is this God who in relationship with you is making promises about your future and you trust in, you trust in him. It's almost like the difference between trusting in the details of a future, even that you believe God has said to you, it's the difference between believing in that and believing in God. Because everything in the kingdom of God boils down to reconciling. That means bringing you close together again with God the Father. The goal is not to reconcile you with an awesome future. In fact, some Christian traditions take this way too far, in my opinion, and they leave people basically on the doorstep of dashed expectations, thinking that God is like, he's like my sugar daddy. Not just my daddy, he's my sugar daddy. And he's going to make me some, you know, success and prosperity. But that's not it. The goal is not to reconcile you with the future. The goal is to reconcile you in relationship to God the Father. And sometimes that happens right in the midst of suffering. It happens in the midst of loss. It doesn't necessarily happen in the midst of success. It also can do that, but it's sort of irrelevant. The whole goal is relationship with the Father. In fact, sometimes I think in our, in our uh, Pentecostal traditions, we sometimes forget in a way about God the Father because we focus so much on Jesus. Now, it is true that in, in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, so much has happened. But do you understand the ministry or the service of Jesus is to gather us together as a good shepherd, but he is taking us like a package and delivering us to the Father because that is the biggest picture goal is to reconcile us to the Father. And Jesus has been sent by the Father 
to reconcile us to himself. Now, we also have that ministry of reconciliation that you and I also get to tell one another. We get to exhibit that same kind of service and love, compassion, care, and wisdom to bring others, others to God the Father. That's the ultimate goal, relationship with God the Father. And see, it's the Father who provides these promises to us, and we can come and live in that place of promise. It's all made possible by Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's really the God the Father, your creator, who is longing to be with you. And he has, a, he has literally moved heaven and earth in order to be with you. That's what it's like to live within that promised land. That's the purpose, the goal of promise, is that you would be secured for your future. Well, I want to read a story in Genesis chapter 15, if you have your Bibles with you. This is a story about a man named Abram, who later was renamed by God Abraham as a part of covenant tradition, exchanging names. He even got his name changed. But we're going to see in the story of Abram, a man who greatly struggled with believing, really, the promises of God. And this poor guy had to be reassured so many times. God said, I will give you a son. That was, that was the big thing with, with Abram. He did not have an, an heir. He didn't have a son to pass everything along to. But God had promised him that I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Like, how does that work if I don't have a son? And so that was, that was Abram's big journey of faith to believe that God was actually going to give him a son. Um, this is a story that we, we sort of went over about a year ago. And um, for those of you who, who know me well, you'll know that I really don't like doing the same thing twice. It, like, it is so hard. It's like nails on chalkboard. So the fact that I'm going over the story again, like, even within a five-year span, tells you that God must have spoken divinely to me to speak from this passage because I wouldn't even use an eraser in school because taking the pencil and turning it all the way over <laughs> for the eraser, too much effort. You lose forward progress doing that, so just etch the correct spelling into the word and then keep going. Or going into my backpack to get out another piece of paper from my math homework, unacceptable. Thinking about all those precious seconds spent opening the backpack, getting out the binder, you got to open the binder, and then open the binder thing, and take a piece of paper and put it back in, when I could have been solving math that entire time. <laughs> and let's get real, what would you rather do, get in a backpack or do math? You know what I mean? I'm glad we're all on the same page. One page. <laughs> that worked out. Um, but we're going to come back to this because it's just such a good story to show a man in his humanity kind of believe in God. <laughs> and that's how I feel. That's how I felt this last week. So we're going to read it. Genesis chapter 15. I'm going to start in verse number 1. Now after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. And your reward shall be very great. Sorry, I forgot one other thing. Um, I looked up how many promises were in the Bible. I did not have time in a couple of hours on Saturday morning to independently verify this. So take it with a grain of salt. Because I did not read the whole Bible in that time. Um, but I found reports of anywhere between 3,000 and 6,000 promises in the Bible. For you and me. Three thousand, six, between three and six thousand. Let's just call it thousands of promises that are in here for you and me. Many of them are kind of um, buried, so to speak, in some of the, the way that the language is. It's not always God saying, I promise to do this. Sometimes it's a little bit more subtle, like this last phrase in verse number one, where God says, your reward shall be very great. That is God making a promise saying, you are going to receive a reward from, from me, says the Lord. That was a promise that God made to, to Abram. Abram responds back and says, O Lord God, 
what are you going to give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, since you have given me no offspring, one born in my house is my heir. He means like, um, like a nephew. Basically, the next oldest male would be the heir if Abram did not have a son. So it would be like a nephew or something like that. And uh, Abram is kind of like, hey, thanks for that awesome promise. But what does it matter if you're my shield because I don't have this? And um, man, God is so kind. This is like, this is major misdirection on Abram's part. Like, yeah, cool, thanks for the shield bit, but really what I want is this. You ever find yourself doing that with God? Danger zone, right? Because you're saying, maybe a little ungrateful for what God has given you and saying, but I won't be satisfied until I get this. Nevertheless, the Lord responds very kindly. Verse four. And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abram saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And God took him outside and said, now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And God said, so shall your descendants be. (laughs) This is so awesome. We know a little bit more about the number of stars now than probably Abram did because, you know, telescopes and all that and science. Um, especially like God's having a little fun there, you know, like, hey, count the stars <clears throat> if you can count them. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Do you, man. When you really come face to face with the reality of the kinds of promises that God gives us in our lives, it is that kind of unreachability that we have to come face to face with. The kinds of stuff that God is saying, look at the expanse of what I have for you. It is uncountable and out of reach. You see, that's another just really profound principle in the scriptures is that true blessing is only ever achieved when you step into a place of promise that you did not make for yourself. Somebody else makes a place for you and you step into that. That's where blessing comes. That's where fulfillment comes. But this offends like every American sense. I should say this for a 4th of July message. Every American sensibility. No, no, I pull myself up by my bootstraps. I created this business with a nickel in my pocket. I'm the first of my generation to go to college. No, no, I did this. I did this. I accomplished this. This American ideal of with our freedom, we do great things. And really, they believe fundamentally, if you set your mind to it, this is the Disney doctrine, if you just believe it hard enough, if you want it hard enough, you can have it. Ah, the American God has thusly spoken and says, you can do it, Americans. But in the Bible, what the Bible teaches us is that blessing and satisfaction only comes when you step into a place that someone else has made for you. Think about this with respect to like parents and children. When a parent has a child, a covenant is established right then and there. And what is supposed to happen is that parent is supposed to create this space. And as the child lives in the space that the parent creates for them, that child receives blessing. And why it's so, it's, it's sad, it's grievous, it's violating. When the child has to create a space for the parent, when the child has to be the mature one, when the child has to be the one with the, with the square head on their shoulders to calm mom down in this situation, that's not how it's supposed to be. Or when a person believes, well, I'm gonna make a place for myself. I'm gonna make a name for myself. You're really robbing yourself of biblical blessing. And no wonder those people have a really hard time interacting with God. Because God says, blessing is available to you, but you have to step into the place that God makes for you. He's the one who makes promises, but he's also the only one that can keep them. My tendency is God promises me something and I'm like, great, thank you for telling me what I now have to do. And God's like, "Uh, no, 
I said, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm like, yes, thank you. Now I know what I need to do. And I try to accomplish the things that God has said he is going to do. That is not covenant. Covenant is God says, I'm going to do this. And you just get to receive it. But some brokenness in me, my rearrangement of this part of covenant with God is like, I have a hard time letting him do that. And that's, that's not how it's supposed to be. It's like if one of my daughters, my daughters are six, six, and three. If somehow I was having a conversation with them and I was talking to them about how I want to provide for them. I have this job, I pay the bills, you know, we buy food, we provide for you, great. And then if one of my daughters is like, awesome, I'm going to get a job and make as much money as you, dad, and then I'm going to provide for all of my needs at six years old. What? What you do with God when you try to accomplish what he says he's going to do for you is more ridiculous than that. We can't accomplish what God has promised he'll, he will do. And I wonder how many of us are living in broken covenant with God because you're trying to do what he said he would do for you. Let's go on. Verse six, then Abram believed in the Lord and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is like one of the most famous verses. Wow, Abram, man of faith. Except that this whole thing is like a big old Oreo sandwich with doubt on either side. So Abram's like, you haven't given me a son. Thanks for the shield thing. Not super interested in that. And God's like, okay, let me reiterate my promise to you. And Abram, okay, I believe you. And then we're going to read right after this, right after that. Even in the New Testament, it calls Abram the father of faith. Oh, the father of faith. Big man of faith. Right after this, he doubts again. Because, you know, humans. It's like this last weekend. Oh, my gosh. This last weekend was an incredible weekend. You know, we had friends from around the world and... And uh, we had, it culminated in this beautiful worship night. The kids were playing out there and having fun with one another. We were eating pizza, which is like totally heavenly, obviously. And then we came in and we had this awesome worship night. And at one point in, in, in the worship night, <laughs> I got to tell you this story. So my mom, my mom was, was over here. She was, she was sitting over there. And, and um, man, as soon as the music started playing, I just could tell that the Holy Spirit was wanting to, to do something. And so I'm just, I'm worshiping, but I'm also listening to God because that's a part of, that's a part of my role um, to be listening. And okay, God, do you want us to do anything? Or how do you want to, how do you want to arrange things? That's always what I'm, what I'm doing here. And so my mom comes over maybe like four songs into it and she sits down right next to me. And I was sitting down because my back was a little sore. And I look over at her and I'm like, what took you so long? And she was, like, ready to, like, share this, you know, like, really serious, you know, like, deep thing. And then she starts busting up laughing. I'm like, I've been waiting. Like, I knew God wanted to speak something, so what took you so long? So she, we had a good laugh about that. And then she, she shared some stuff. And then that led to me offering to pray for a bunch of people. So Pastor Nidian from Colombia, Pastor Felix from Peru, and myself, we stood right over here. And we prayed for... I think we prayed for like 75 or 100 people, something like that. It was crazy. Like the line just did not end. And I just kept praying. And as I was praying, the Lord was giving me pictures and, and words. And, and it was like 15-second prayers. And um, it was incredible. It was incredible. And then the next day, I wake up, and I'm like, what am I even doing with my life? I, don't, I just don't think... I'm making a difference. I don't think I'm doing anything. It's not worthwhile. It's all going to fall apart tomorrow. And I started to fight a head cold. And so I am a man, and you might know about men that when we're sick, it's super hard. <laughs> it's like super hard. I don't think ladies understand how hard it is. Just physically, you know what I mean? I'm not sure. 
ladies have experienced a kind of physical <laughs> challenge. You know, I can't think of anything that ladies have experienced that would match a head cold <laughs> that a man has. I can't think of anything. So you know, I'm feeling physically down and and I just my heart is is just broken and I, I feel hollowed out. I feel like a zero turning into a negative. You know, it's like I'm going the wrong direction. This is this is Abram. You know, God just God just like cast his eyes to the heavens. Look at all the stars. Look at this great expanse that I created. Oh man, that's nothing compared to the promises I have for you in your life. And Abram's like, I believe you. And then a little bit of time transpires. And let's read what he says. Oh, whoops, I skipped a verse. Verse seven, God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. So in this one little verse, actually, is all the three elements of covenant we've been talking about. He says, I am the Lord, exchange of names, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. That's rehearsing history, shared history that has been rehearsed. To give you this land to possess it, he made a promise. See, that's covenantal language right there. God uses this pattern again and again and again. I am the Lord your God who did this thing and I make you promises for the future. You can be sure that I'm going to do that thing. So we come to verse number eight and Abram says, but God, how may I know that I shall possess it? O man of faith, Abram, casts his eyes to the heavens and yet here we are. And he's like, but how do I know? How do I know? I mean, I think we can have some compassion on this poor guy because it is true that God promised him a son ages ago and it had not happened. There's just no denying that. There's no getting around that very difficult reality that there was a time delay between the promise given and the promise fulfilled. And for many of us, isn't that the truth? That is just the savage, honest truth. And it's very difficult. It's very difficult to be in a place where even... Even something God has promised you, you feel like it's a place of need. You know, like, I really need this, Lord. And yet it's delaying. And how you are in that in-between time will bring up all kinds of trials of faith. And I'm, I'm not going to pretend like it's no big deal. Hey, what, what's a couple of decades of unfulfilled promises? Come on, what's the big deal? It's not like that. At least that's not been my experience. My experience has been it's like heart-wrenching, like my gut spilled out everywhere and not exactly knowing what to do. Maybe sometimes not knowing what to believe or who to believe. Very vulnerable. But when Abram says, how do I know? How do I know that you're going to do this thing? I want to analyze God's response because it's, it's, it's the language and activity of covenant, and it encourages me. Verse number nine. So God said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So we have a three-year-old uh, heifer that I'm going to bring out in the back here. No, I'm kidding. It's, we don't do that kind of thing anymore because of Jesus. Aren't you glad? This would have taken a lot longer. <laughs> um, all right, verse number 10. Then Abram brought all these two to the Lord and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not, did not cut the birds. This reminds me of a time when I was at a party and if somebody came in, <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy party. <laughs> it was a crazy party. Um, <laughs> BYO turtle dove really is what it was. <laughs> and I was a part I was at a party one time and somebody came in and, and, and came to this went to this to this gal and is like, Your car got broken into. And she was like, What? I'm like, yeah, your car got broken into. And she just kept like looking at this person like, What? Your car got broken into. And she just was like super confused. I don't understand. Like Someone broke into your car. And she was like, oh, 
I thought you said my car got broken in two. So many rod. It was. It almost made her like relieved. Like, oh. And like, I just. I never forget her face. She was like trying to work that out. Like, how is that possible? <laughs> like, like which way? Like hot dog or hamburger style? Like how? What? <laughs> Who would do that? How? How? And she's like, oh, the stuff inside's gone. Like, at least it. At least it's one car still. Like, at least it's still intact. So Abram brought these animals and, and, and cut them in two and laid them, laid them opposite each other. Um, it's a very strange story. Let's just acknowledge the obvious. This is odd. This is unusual. Verse number 11 is a verse that has confounded me for years, but I think I finally know the answer. It's just an odd detail. It then says, the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. I'm like, what's up with the birds, God? I don't understand that detail. But I think I have an answer, and I'm going to come back to it. Verse 12, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 100 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. And then in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came about that when the sun had set, and it was very dark, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay. So there's a lot about this story that's like, huh? And I aim to, I aim to explain it. So the first thing is that this whole scene is a, it's actually a pretty classic scene of covenant making. This is how they would do it back in the day. And not even just like between God and people. This would be a very common practice that would happen between the leader of like one tribe and another tribe. Like they would say, hey, you're good at, at, at growing grain. You're good at war. Let's get together. Let's form a covenant so that we can be stronger together. And what they would do is they would take an animal and they would, they would saw it in two, open the halves, and then both of the covenant members would walk through the center of the animal. Now, you might be wondering about that. Like, what is up with that? Like, that seems very strange. Well, there's actually a lot of symbolism and great meaning in, in doing that. The first one is that, is the, the, the life of the animal that has been sacrificed signifies the old lives of the two covenant members. That that life, that way of living is basically dead. And that now, because we are coming together, there's an entirely new bond, an entirely new life that is formed, and it is more capable than the life that we are leaving behind. So the easiest way that I understand this is like with marriage. Man and a woman come together, they form this bond, and now you are one. So I'm not just Evan anymore, and my wife isn't just Lindsay. We are married. We are in covenant bond with one another. And the life that we live together is a totally different life than we were, when we were living when we were single. It's a new life. Covenant members, there's new life that comes out of that. And it can be tempting at times, speaking of marriage, to act as if you're still single. And that's a bit of the growing pain sometimes of the, those early years of marriage is learning how to come together rather than living as if you were living as if you were apart. Even something as simple as going out with a buddy to dinner. It's just you have to handle that in a different way when you are married than when you are, when you are single. And that's not like, oh, I've got to call my ball and chain and figure out if it's okay for me to go to dinner. <laughs> that's stupid. It's pathetic. It's not about control. It's about I am a completely new man. Therefore, the way that I interact with life is completely new. It's not about ball and chain. It's about like, yeah, I'm just, I'm a new man. So the two covenant members would walk through the animal to signify 
we are going to be new people completely. The, all the decisions we make moving forward are going to be based upon this covenant that we have together. It's pretty serious, right? Covenant is not something that's just flippant. It's not just like, yeah, oh, whatever. Which again is one of the reasons why it's so off. It's so out of alignment to have some elements of covenant without actually having the covenant itself. Like sleeping around, for instance. That, Christ, that kind of close physical intimacy is supposed to be an expression, an expression, not the only expression, an expression of the closest and intimacy that a husband and wife have together. There's a physical closeness there. And so sleeping around is kind of like having some of the elements of covenant without actually having the covenant. That's why it's so off and misaligned. So you walk through the animal, you two together, you, you've come together, the life that you live is together now, and it's different than when you were, when you were apart. It was important also that blood was shed because you're saying new life is coming out of this covenant bond we're forming together, but the Bible says that all life is in the blood. You cannot have life without the blood. That's why Jesus' blood had to be shed. And I'm not trying to make a joke here, but Jesus could not have been poisoned and have the same effect. It wasn't just his death. It was the specific way that he was sacrificed, that his blood was shed. It was a very important element of that because the blood has this cleansing power to it to usher in the new covenant. I mean, that's even the language we use, the new covenant. We get that from the book of Jeremiah, by the way. It's not just a phrase that we, that we use. So blood was shed. The animal goes into two, and the two become one. You see how there's kind of like some mirror symmetry there? The one becomes two, the two become one. They walk through the animal and say, hey, we're, we're together here. Now, there was one exception to this practice, and it wasn't a good exception. When there was a really strong, powerful tribe boss who wanted to make covenant with a weaker tribe boss, sometimes that stronger one would require the weaker one to walk through the animal alone. And what that said was, you alone, the one who walks through the covenant bonds, is the one who is responsible for keeping the covenant. So the stronger one would force the weaker one, you must go through this, you are responsible for it. Okay? Y'all get that? That's not the way that covenant is supposed to work. Covenant is supposed to be both of us together, we will honor our covenant together, like marriage. But in some cases, the stronger one would say to the weaker one, now you walk through. Okay, now that's where the story gets really interesting. So God tells Abram, prepare the space for us to establish a covenant with one another. And Abram would have known what was happening. As soon as he was cutting the animals one two, he knows, okay, we're going to be establishing a covenant together. But again, the way it's supposed to work is you're both supposed to walk through together. Or if anything... Abram, by, by rights, should have been the only one to have to walk through because God is obviously the stronger party here. But what happens is the torch in the oven, which signify the presence of God, walked through the animal by himself. And Abram, he didn't even have a choice, you guys. Why? Because God did the first story of anesthesia right here. You know, he told Abram, okay, cut the animals in two and start counting down from ten. 10, 9, and then he conks out. So he's asleep. And then he's having this vision of all this happening. But because, like, do you get that? He didn't even have a choice. He wasn't even like, oh, no, 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 God, I don't want you to go through it yourself. I want to go through it too. God didn't even give him an option. He just went through by himself, which was a huge sign where God is saying, I am taking on the position of the lesser and I'm gonna be the one who fulfills the covenant. It won't depend on you. We learn from this such a, oh, amazing principle that what we are to do when God is establishing a covenant with us is not keeping the covenant per se, but it is being willing to take my old life and Put it before the Lord. Put all the pieces. Maybe it's not just two pieces of your old life. Maybe it's just a, yeah, a ton of pieces. I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. 
you lay out those pieces before the Lord and you see him establish, or maybe like Abram, this isn't the first time God did this. He reestablished a covenant with Abram in this moment. Maybe you need a reestablishing of the covenant and to be reminded that God is the one who has promised and God is gonna be the one who fulfills. And all the temptation that we have to try to take what God has promised and fulfill it ourselves. Maybe you've been impatient. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're fearful. And so you've been trying to wrestle control from God and accomplish the things that he said he would do, but do it by your own hand, rather than witnessing God saying, I will be the one to fulfill this covenant. I also thought about like, why, what's up with the darkness? Verse 12, you know, the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. I'm like, God, what is that? You're a good God. Like you don't give us horrible, terrible dreams. But this is what I realized. The, the presence of God was an oven and a torch. These are things that are literally on fire. To see the contrast of the presence of God actually going through this, to witness him, to perceive him doing what he is doing, almost in a way required a certain darkness for Abram to perceive it. And I'm not saying that like God is gonna destroy your life just so he can show up his show his presence there but i think for some the doubting that you have is so consuming that god knows he needs to draw an extreme contrast to convince you he really is there it's almost like your efforts are shining a light that obscures the presence of god and so sometimes God does allow us to go through difficult things, not to rub salt in our wounds, but to in the end, provide us with the most precious thing that we can have, and that is faith. That what God said he would do, he will do. And that he is reconciling us to himself. How many of us have faced very difficult dark times in our lives where we're not even sure we can see anything. And it just seems like it's getting darker and darker and darker. That is a scene where the torch in the oven of God can be seen clear as day, so to speak. There's a scripture, it says, so then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs but on God who has mercy. So whether you're doing great or whether you were like me this last week that, yeah, just, sometimes the feeling that I wanna give up is so strong and it's like irrational sometimes, coming off an incredible time. But th this again is just, it's a brokenness that I have, it's, it's like, I am not interacting with God in a way that I know his promises will be kept no matter what. And I wanna see his torch go through my life. So let's get back to the birds of prey. What's up with the birds of prey? Why was it, why is it a deal? Is this just to complete the scene, just to kind of let you picture what's going on here? He's, he's cutting the animals and stuff and the birds come in, hey, get out of here, what are you doing? Well, this whole week that I had just helped me understand. Like I said, it's been a, it's been, it's not like the worst week ever. It just, I felt really, really hollowed out. Like no thoughts. Like blank inside. Like a Hallmark blank inside card. You open me up and there's just, there's no greeting. There's no little quip. Just a crease. <laughs> totally blank. And um, man, last night was brutal trying to fall asleep and all I could hear was you're not doing enough you didn't do enough you didn't do enough with your kids you didn't do enough with your wife your work church this that this situation that situation fear 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 inability you're weak or as I'm learning here carcass 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 
the dead pieces of my life splayed out. And these birds of prey are like the enemy that just wants to disturb you and me when we are trying to live in a rightful covenant with the Lord. And yeah, we are laying down our old lives, our old selves. The New Testament puts it this way, the dead man, the dead woman. The enemy wants to remind you of the death that you're trying to come out of as a way of distracting you from what God is wanting to do through that place or in that place. And so I couldn't sleep last night because I'm just so focused on the carcasses instead of witnessing God go through them, so to speak, as a way of reestablishing his covenant with me, his promises in my life, and that I can count on his promises. He is the promise maker and the promise keeper. So like Abram, you and I, can, can uh, what, is it, what does it say here? Drive away those birds of prey. The birds of prey of the enemy that just want to rob you of, frankly, the joy of like, thank you, God, for what you are doing. Thank you for what you have done. You are the Lord God who brought me out of that land. You are the Lord God who's bringing me into even more promise than I have experienced before. You are that God. And instead of keeping my eyes on the Lord, I've got my eyes like dead carcass eyes. You know what I mean? I'm looking at those stinking eyes and like, oh man, that doesn't look so good. But that's kind of the point. Don't you get it? That our lives are no longer defined by that. Our lives are defined by the covenant that God has decided to keep by himself. And whether I will or I run, I am in this place of promise and it secures me for my future. I'm not saying it's laziness. I'm not saying you, you don't do anything. I mean, I imagine, I've never done this before, but I imagine it's a lot of work to cut an animal into. So there is stuff for us to do. There is a way for you and I to engage in the covenant. But as far as the ultimate keeping of the covenant, that is all in the hands of God because of the way that he has decided to be with us. You think about Jesus coming, humbling himself to the form of a bond servant. It's like this moment when God humbled himself and said, I'll walk through as the, as the lesser party through this covenant animal to form this bond with you. And it will be the blood of my son, Jesus, who will establish a new covenant that can never be broken. Oh, Jeremiah 31. And you will know I will be your God, he says, because I will be in you. It won't be this external thing. It won't be a thing of actions. You will understand the promise because it will live inside of you. The Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit given to us in promise of promise to reiterate his promises inside you so that you can, no matter what is happening outside of you, live in rightful covenant with the Lord. And the way that it is supposed to work is God pouring his promises on us begins this cascade, like a beautiful waterfall, cascade of covenant to the people around us so that I can make promises to my wife and fulfill them. I can make promises to my kids and fulfill them. I can make promises to you and fulfill them. That's how it is supposed to work. Now, I know that it doesn't really work that way and that it's all broken and stuff, but just give me one week of like enjoying, this is the way it's supposed to work, and we'll talk about how it gets broken later and how the Lord has redeemed all of that. But that's the picture of the cascade of covenant. You live in the promised land. You create promised lands for others in a way, and they live in the blessing of that. And we have this true community where one is promising to another, is promising to another, is promising to another, and in that way, our needs are taken care of. That's what community is like. That's the way it's supposed to work. So be encouraged if you feel like a hollowed out, chopped up animal. Because God wants to walk through you <laughs> and establish an everlasting covenant. I might work on the language of that uh, analogy later on, but I don't know. It's Genesis chapter 15. Hallelujah. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on him. Would you go enjoy your Sunday? 
just enjoying that space of God doing what he's gonna do and you just getting to receive it. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.